Terus dia ada yang cowok. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our Think Tank 2022 public lecture series. This month, uh, we have a great honor and pleasure to have uh, Professor Dr. Cham uh, Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of AVI, as a, our distinguished uh, speaker uh, on the topic, which is very timely relevant, uh, Buddhist philosophy, and scientific thinking. Uh, Professor Cham Kirati is a medical doctor, science diplomat, educator, and historian with extended experience in digital science and technology, uh, global health diplomacy, nuclear technology policy, and executive education. So he holds uh, three PhDs, in a uh, very field, so very, very rare to have a Cambodian scholar who have a broad knowledge and understanding on many issues relating to history, education, science. Uh, without further ado, uh, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Jamkedruti to, to give us a, a, a short kind of uh, lecture on Buddhist philosophy and scientific thinking. But before that, I would like to draw your attention that yesterday, uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen uh, received uh, honorary title as the patron of the World Fellowship of Buddhists. And uh, His Excellency uh, Hun Manet also received uh, honorary title as senior advisor to uh, the World Fellowship uh, of Buddhists. Uh, so this is a significant uh, moment uh, in terms of uh, Buddhism, the promotion of Buddhism uh, in Cambodia and, and the region. And perhaps I would like, first of all, to seek uh, the comments and perspective on, on this from uh, Professor Dr. Jam Karuti. What is your view on this uh, uh, conferment of honorary title to uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen and uh, Excellency Hun Manet with regards to uh, their role in the, uh, Buddhism? I uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, the one that. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm absolutely thrilled and pleased to hear that uh, some black prime minister has been conferred a title as a patron of the World Federation of Buddhists and also uh, His Excellency General Hun Manet, uh, who has been uh, nominated, appointed as a senior advisor for this prestigious organization with a global reach. I think this I, the move uh, to consider Buddhism as a philosophy, as a guidance for our daily life is vital for the future of any country, particularly our country, in which uh, Buddhism is one of the pillar of our constitution. In a world that is a uh, violent, you know, uh, uncertain war or pandemic, uh, economic downturn, people need to seek some refuge in a certain level of spirituality. And a society that is growing fast with the incoming of this new technology, intelligent technology that affect our daily life a spiritual or moral compass is much needed. So all these uh, news are very important to us and having our uh, get political leaders, especially at the level of a prime minister as leading this uh, movement uh, related to Buddhism activities is uh, quite uh, essential uh, for to support uh, the progress and the building of a harmonious 
society and nation in the future. Uh, technology will help Cambodia to boost her economy, industry, but technology alone will not uh, bring happiness or justice in our society. Uh, I think during this seminar, uh, I will uh, bring both perspectives together. Uh, one is the Buddhist perspective from the philosophical angle, and two, the science and technology angle. I, from my own experience, uh, I have been a scientist for 40, 45 years now, and always in my activities, in my research, in my commitment to take care of uh, my patient as a medical doctor, in my interaction with colleagues, scientists, non-scientists, policy maker, regionally, internationally, uh, some Buddhist principles are always present in my mind. And I like to uh, provide a disclaimer here. I'm not a Buddhist scholar. I have limited knowledge of the esoteric dimension of Buddhism, but because I have written a history thesis on the history of Buddhist medicine at the 13th century at Angkor during the reign of King Jayaman VII. I came to be aware that many foundational principles of Buddhism that allow us to reach harmony and wisdom in life can be applied to scientific activity and also not only to the application and practice of science and technology, but also to the thinking of science, the scientific method. Uh, so with this, uh, I'm happy to answer your question. I think as a moderator, you may have prepared some key question uh, so that we can have a a conversation and a kind of a discussion about the similarities and some differences between Buddhist philosophical consideration and the scientific thinking. Yeah, thank, thank you, Professor. So since you're also a professor at Camtech University, it's a newly established uh, technology oriented uh, university here. Uh, yesterday, Prime Minister also mentioned that uh, he he would like to encourage all education academic institutions in Cambodia to include uh, Buddhist uh, philosophy, ethics uh, in their education. So what is your plan for, for Camtech as a professor and also uh, one of the key leaders at Camtech University? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, you know, my, uh, my full-time job currently is to be a senior government official, but it is a... Uh, I have, it all, I, has, I have always considered this um, intellectual academic activities as a, a healthy activity for myself. In order to serve well, you have to be uh, uh, conscious of your internal peace, you know, building harmony in order to provide and to serve uh, a, a, a uh, public uh, institution like uh, ministries and in government. So, at Camtech, uh, I have the privilege uh, to be the founding uh, teacher, professor of technology and humanities. Uh, I have advice in the curriculum design. Certainly our government and the country is pushing STEM education because we all know that without STEM education, it would be difficult for Cambodia to reach uh, economic goal in 2030 and 2050. But we all know, even myself, as a scholar, as a scientist, and social scientist, and scholar of humanities, we all know that science without conscience is ruin of the soul, to quote a, a very uh, great uh, French scholar in a uh, medieval time. So at Camtech, first, we make sure that the curriculum is enriched by humanities. Uh, so we include uh, humanities and social science, you know, philosophy of uh, technology, sociology, anthropology, history, uh, Khmer studies, uh, uh, arts in the curriculum 
to make sure that uh, our student in the future uh, will not only become competent engineers, you know, as computer scientists, expert in data science or artificial intelligence, um, a, uh, automation and robotics, et cetera, that when they go to work on the workplace, they will have to solve a problem helping the society. And science technology can help. We will come back to those points in improving people's life. But also science and technology has also some uh, unexpected consequences on society. And our graduates should be able to address both the technical and the social uh, uh, impact of new technologies. The motto at this university, from what I see from uh, from the, uh, the the brochure of the university and the philosophy here is knowledge, reasoning, and character. So all these are part of scientific reasoning, construction of knowledge, and also the building of a strong ethical standards. And lastly, uh, we all now live a very fascinating uh, period of humankind. Fascinating and sometimes scary. Never ever human has designed technology that is competing with our mind, you know, intelligent robotic and the last uh, uh, craze in the world of technology and particularly among the youth is this uh, generate uh, uh, artificial intelligence in the form of chat GPT and uh, GPT-4. So all this will raise question, uh, epistemological question, ethical questions about the construction of knowledge, the application knowledge, and the ethical standard on how we apply knowledge, how we build knowledge in academic center and outside in the society. So uh, I have the intention to launch a Center for Buddhist Ethics at this university. And certainly ABI members will be invited. All of those who are interested in this kind of topic will be uh, welcome to this group. It's a, it has to be inclusive. The university is not an ivory tower. University has to be open uh, to the community and to the society. So overall, to sum up, I think it's a great day. Uh, the, the timing for this seminar is perfect. I myself personally, I didn't, I was not aware that uh, I, this week there will be also that uh, grand I, 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 you know, visit of the World I, a Fellowship of, uh, of uh, Buddhists. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite timely. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. You, you mentioned the word character. I would like to continue this conversation. I don't think many universities uh, focus on character, but Camtech, you put the term uh, character as one of the, mo the uh, one of the three keywords in, in your motto or slogan there. Uh, yesterday, uh, our Prime Minister, together with uh, 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 um, the eldest son, uh, uh, Excellency Hunmanat, together, uh, received this honorary title. This is, from, from my observation, this is the first time that the the father and the son, the current generation of leadership and the future generation of leadership uh, share the same stage, uh, receiving this uh, honor title. So when it comes to character or leadership here, uh, your assessment of the virtuous kind of leadership quality of Prime Minister Hun Sen, and as well as the uh, Excellency Khun Manet, your, your personal perspective on their characters when it comes to this kind of Buddhist uh, ethics, uh, virtuous leadership style. It's, uh, it's quite a, a difficult question, but for me, it's very clear that if you look at our prime minister over the last 40 years, there's no doubt that without drive, character, vision, you know, he wouldn't be able to bring us out of a genocidal regime to a complete uh, peace across the kingdom and economic growth. You know? So it's quite a an achievement, an achievement for himself and also an achievement for all Cambodian people. I don't think that we would be able 
to have a luxury to think, reflect on Buddhism and scientific thought if there's no peace in our country. You just look around the world, uh, all this um, tragedy that occurred currently in Africa, South Sudan, in Europe. Europe is at war, you know, through NATO, Ukraine war. If you have a, a bomb and rocket, uh, you know, falling your head, there's no time to reflect. You know? So that's, uh, I am personally grateful uh, to the Prime Minister for his great leadership. And the transition to his, you know, uh, his Excellency Jean Hun Manet also, you know, have he been a, he has, he is actually a scholar, you know, trained in uh, a, a very prestigious academic uh, 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 military uh, college. Uh, you can tell about the discipline, physical discipline and discipline of the mind. And also trained as an economist an economist for me is a social scientist and having interacted, interacted with him several times in the recent past, uh, one of his key quality is his ability to listen like prime minister, you know, like his father, very active listening. And as a leader who can listen, uh, you know, if you have no compassionate heart, you cannot listen to people. So all these patterns uh, are those who belong to pattern that belong to Buddhist philosophy, you know, metta and karuna. So that's very important. If you don't love people, it's not possible to lead people, as simple as that. So I like to wish uh, to some like Prime Minister and General von Manet a, all the best a good health and particularly uh, for their ability and sacrifice to take a lot of time from their life to lead this country. So I believe that uh, we are thriving to the next level of Cambodia development. The challenge ahead are two. Number one is a arriving of this intelligent technology, very scary. We need to regulate, we need to think, we need to reflect, you, have, you need to have a societal dialogue about that. And number two, the destruction of environment, not only in our country, uh, but many others, destruction to a different level. But as a historian, if you look at why do we have that climate change today is that at one point, humans cease to live in harmony with nature. And we know also that from the Buddhist perspective, human and nature are all part of a unity. And you look at climate changes, you know, climate changes not caused by Cambodia. It started 250 years ago when Europe started to industrialize. But so we pay the consequences and looking into this, uh, we can question how much Western philosophical thought has contributed to you know, the mitigation of the relationship between human and nature. If you look at the degree of destruction environment the last 250 years, uh, I tend to think that uh, many uh, philosophical thought has failed to guide uh, leadership across the globe. But now, uh, Cambodia being the late comer, we just started our industry. You cannot say that our industry destroyed environment. We have, we just started. So we have a lot to learn from mistakes from the past, but also I hope that, and I believe that also, that our leaders, the top leader will be inspired by all this philosophical uh, uh, consideration from Buddhism. And I know that it's not that it had not been done. Actually, yesterday I received a copy uh, uh, through my colleague from the Ministry of Environment, uh, Dr. Ponlok. Uh, it's a book about Buddhism and forestry and environment. Uh, so it's published by the ministry. Uh, so definitely uh, our government, our royal government is aware of all the risks uh, for the present future. and. Uh, many steps have been taken, it's not just today. So I hope that with the 
revival of Buddhism allowed by the establishment of a, of a peace across the kingdom will allow you, us to go further. Great, a uh, very inspiring uh, with regards to this kind of a uh, people driven leadership and leadership with compassion, with love, right? And um, I'm glad to, to see uh, this kind of, uh, of trend uh, happening here in Cambodia. Um, let's move to our philosophical conversation here. Um, I have a few questions to ask you. First, uh, as the topic of this uh, public lecture series suggests, um, we try to understand the relationship and connection between Buddhism and scientific thinking. So my, my first question is, what are the key uh, fundamental principles of Buddhism that overlap uh, with scientific thinking? Hmm. So first of all, I'd like to present my apologies to Buddhist uh, studies uh, scholars because I'm not. Uh, so I learned Buddhism through reading texts, mostly in English, except the Vinay Vedak, the 13th volume that I have read twice in, in Khmer. So if you look at these two approaches to explanation and understanding, of the world around us and of ourselves and our relation with, relationship between human and nature, there were many big principles of Buddhism that are applied and could and have actually inspired scientific thinking. First, the concept of impermanence. We know Buddha said everything mm -hmm. is impermanent, everything is changing, nothing stands still. But we look at science studying the physical world that the physical world is always in a state of flux. That's so number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, we have been taught also a non-attachment, uh, non-attachment uh, to material possessions. Uh, that's difficult in a very uh, modern materialistic world. So Buddha taught that try not to be attached to those. And what happened from the scientific point of view, as a, as a scientist, we try also to detach, to have some objectivity when we conduct our research, not to be biased by our emotional attachment to things. For example, do research because uh, you have a good salary. We do research because we're interested in the question. Another concept is interdependence, interconnectedness. You know? Buddha emphasized that we have connection with all, with everything. Okay? And in physical science, uh, the scientists, we think we emphasize also complex system and ecological interconnectedness. So they're very, very close, you know. I, number four is skepticism. I'm talking about positive skepticism. I'm not talking about the <laughs> skeptics in ancient Greece, but skeptical like René Descartes and Buddha. Yeah? So skepticism encourages critical thinking. You don't believe what people say, tell you. And same thing, what do we do in science? We encourage skepticism and challenge and proven belief. So there's a lot of similarity. And then the most important one is, is empirical observation. Let's not forget that Buddhism is not a religion with God. We don't have God. Buddha was a man. He was a prince. Yeah? So it's called agnostic religion. Uh, so in that case, we place a lot of values on observation, careful observation. So scientific approach is about observation of everything around us, collect the data, make analysis, based on concept, and come with the synthesis to provide the truth to a certain degree. And the same thing from Buddha, uh, he emphasized empirical observation, but more on top of that, this is a bit different from science is the personal experience, the feeling. And last is the concept of mindfulness, encourage mindfulness, you know, meditation that you're aware of the present. And at the same time, you look at science, when you do experiment, we nurture awareness of the moment. So overall, it's quite interesting that in terms of a foundational uh, principle and philosophical pattern, uh, scientific thinking and uh, Buddhist thinking are quite uh, are similar. Thank you. Very comprehensive. And I think quite sophisticated, the, the five concepts. 
that you raised, uh, I, I hope uh, our audience uh, perhaps need to, to do uh, a bit further to understand those concepts uh, such as uh, uh, mindfulness, uh, uh, imperialism, right? Uh, imperialism, uh, imperial observation, uh, impermanent, uh, those kind of uh, concepts are very relevant in scientific thinking and also in leadership uh, developments and analysis of the situations. Um, uh, my, my next question uh, relates to the truth, right, uh, of, of this relationship. So what is the pursuit of truth from both Buddhist and scientific perspective? I think mm -hmm. uh, it, perhaps you, you need to define the word truth first because mm -hmm. I think uh, all of us have different definition of truth. And now we're facing with the uh, fake news, uh, disinformation and so on. So uh, mm -hmm. how to seek truth is very important purpose of life. Uh, so, hey, truth, it would take three hours to talk about that. We can organize another one on truth. It's not that easy because it's constructed, it's uh, observed, and knowledge. Knowledge has been defined by epistemologists, the expert on the philosophy of knowledge. Knowledge is justified through belief. Né? But this is a concept that is quite... Um, I demand uh, some time to think, but let's look at here uh, what is what are the similarity or some connection between the truth as defined by Buddhist principles and truth by scientists. So Buddha thought that truth is realized through direct experience and insight in the nature of reality. So you have to experience yourself without experience there is no truth possible. So he has a very interesting scientific approach. It's more like a, um, what should I say? A As thought a experiment. Those kind thought of experiment. Uh, yeah, yeah. experiments. Yeah. Thought experiment. yeah. But you look at science, the pursuit of truth involves the use of empirical yeah. method yeah, to investigate the nature world. Yeah. If you want to see if a, the water is hot or not, you just put the thing and then you burn your finger. That's very uh, accurate, you know, is it use empirical, and sometimes you use a lot of uh, devices. But there are similarity because both Buddhism and science emphasize careful observation and critical inquiry. So you have to observe. Observation is very important. And number two, both recognize the limitation of our perception because what is knowledge or what is the reality is about our perception in the mind, you know. So we recognize that is about experience, but at the same time, we can have false perception. Yeah. And number three, both share commitment to understand the truth. So seeking the truth. Um, why? Uh, you know, uh, as a scientist, we have a project, for example, to determine the cause of a COVID-19 pandemic. It took about two to three weeks for scientists to identify the virus. That's science. But from the Buddhist perspective, pushing truth to a higher level, it takes the whole life, you know, seeking truth. Uh, Buddha took several lives before he attained Nirvana. That probably to me, the highest level of truth, you know? Yeah. And Buddhists emphasized the importance also of subjective experience, inner wisdom. That's not probably the personality of a scientist. Most scientists are quite objective, they're cold, they don't want to show their emotion. Actually, it's very boring to interact with scientists. I interact with scientists all my life. And, but myself, I want to share also the human side of a scientist, the compassion, you know, the love, the emotion. So every time I'm invited to give a conference, for example, the physical principle for magnetic resonance spectroscopy, trying to look at how new neonate mice react to a kind of trauma. I, I always, at the end of my talk, make some philosophical reflection. And as a result, personally, I gain very much because every time I go to a conference, after the conference, somebody invites me to the next one not because of my knowledge in science, but because of my reflection, they found that very fun and that it uh, uh, dilute the stress of scientists 
And it, it served me well because over the last 35, 40 years, I've been invited to more than 80 countries to talk about science. And they wait for my last reflection on the philosophy of, uh, of knowledge or philosophy of life. Yeah. So Buddhism certainly em emphasized the importance of that subjective part, but science focused on objective data. We like data and verifiable result. We need to verify, scientists verify. But in Buddhism, you know, wisdom in the peace cannot be verified. Yeah. If you go through a meditation, you sleep well, it's very empirical, it's a personal experience. It cannot be duplicated and repeated by other. And that's the difference between science and Buddhism. And finally, Buddh Buddhism prioritized development of compassion and altruism, you know, to do good for others. Yeah. And the Bodhisattva, Ava Lokiteshwara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, that's about their role. Mm -hmm. But science is more value neutral, doesn't prescribe ethical values. And that's the point that uh, scientists practice their science in the lab, but I think that the research in the lab should be regulated, not to allow the scientists to sway. We, many examples, Frankenstein, you know, start to do things, weird things. Uh, so at the end of the day, from my own experience, that science uh, is certainly by nature objective, but should not be completely shielded from societal value because scientists and scientific research have been paid by society. So have to return the fruit of science uh, to apply in, for the well-being of society. So this part of truth, I share with you some pattern. Uh, definitely Buddhism and science share some good common patterns. Yeah, it's a very difficult to differentiate between subjective thinking and objective thinking because all of us are humans, not, not a machine. Yeah. Maybe no. a machine, I, I'm not sure whether machine purely are objective because the, the human beings control the machine and human beings have emotions. So uh, very difficult to differentiate between subjective thinking and objective thinking. Maybe you, you share a bit more on, on, on this. Uh, it's very, very uh, gray area and very blur. Thank you for bringing that because, you know, despite my busy schedule, like all a colleague in the government and outside the government, on my spare time, little spare time, late night or some left time during the weekend, I'm conducting a research looking at how I try to put on both sides the balance between a man, man with big M, man and woman, and on the other side, intelligent robot. How can they, particularly when some scientists try to put right the algorithm, uh, try to create emotion in, in, the, in the robots. So because we talk about leadership, who are gonna lead the world in the very near future? Men or machine? That's a big question. And so I have no answer because um, it's a point of reflection. I always repeat I, the same question when I, I'm invited to a scientific uh, meeting, particularly on this uh, digital tech, intelligent tech. Who's going to be more dangerous uh, in leading the world? And also the situation. What is who, what, what or who is more dangerous? A man who thinks like a machine? Like, like a scientist? Scientists sometimes think like a machine. I got a problem at, at home. Sometimes my wife, she's upset with me that you think like a robot is so black and white. Uh, the world is not like that. So I learned wisdom from her. Uh, she's my Buddhist teacher at home. And on the other hand, how about a machine who think like, man, and it's coming, you know, it's coming. They chat GPT, GPT-4 and Ernie, China and more to come now. All these uh, generator and AI raise a question. You know? It's conversational, conversational, conversational. I talk with the chat GPT. I, I've been polite and he replied polite. I asked him, please, can you? I put please, you know? But you don't need to do that. Just trigger, you prompt, uh, draft a schedule for this program, this panel. He would, I would, please, I try to teach. So I put a please all the time. Hopefully, 
one day say, uh, kindly find my response. I want to teach this uh, uh, smart uh, algorithm politeness. Yeah? So all these are very important questions in the future. We, we, one day we, at AVI, we can run a seminar with Camtech or other colleagues on the changing nature of interaction man and machine. It would be interesting, Professor. Looking forward to that conversation. Uh, man versus machine <coughs> and um, how we interact uh, with machine as a human. Uh, my third question relating to logic. Um, uh, recently, Prime Minister mentioned three kind of um, analytical approach. First, historical approach. Second, empirical approach. And third, logics. I think you already mentioned uh, empirical approach and yeah. observation uh, as historical approach. And now we move to logic. So Prime Minister actually used this three analytical mm. approach to analyze situation domestically mm. and internationally. And he all get, he, he's going to train uh, the young leaders of Cambodia uh, on, on analytical approach, maybe after he, he retired, I, I'm not sure, but that's what he said publicly. So now we move to logic, which is one of the key uh, important areas of uh, leadership and an analytical, an analytical approach here. So what is the connection between the Buddhist logic and scientific thought? So first, I was very delighted to hear Prime Minister revealing the foundation of his thought and his analysis. And actually, when he did an inquiry, except the word logic uh, that he used, I read in the, in the news, translated in English, they're all wrong. It's it a bit, I'm a bit saddened because I found that this is the moment to show the world that our prime minister not only is a great leader, but also a philosopher. Okay? So what he said is that his analysis, he thought, are founded on three philosophical principles. And I want to share with you the right translation. Number one, dialectical materialisms. That's number one from Hegel. Number two, historical philosophy, which is not history. And number three, logical. Yeah, so that the three I repeat, but so important. Dialectical materialism is one of his uh, a, a thought uh, experiment. Number two is historical philosophy and number three, logic. So to come back here again, a uh, Buddhist logic uh, system is a system of reasoning that is quite a, a similar and have some connection with scientific reasoning. Buddhists, uh, you know, emphasize systematic method of investigation to gain insight into the nature of reality. So it, it very systemic. I think Buddha is a scientist, you know? and he tried. He taught us to avoid logical fallacies and erroneous belief. And if you look at how Buddha they behave like a scientist in his teaching, before the modern science had been created much later in Europe, even in Buddhist legend, there were example of science fiction and experimental approach using logic. I share with you a short story here. Jivaka, who's a medical doctor, physician at the court of Bimbisara 2,500 years ago, he consulted at the royal court. At the end of the day, when he left, every time he left that night, he left the court. He found a young boy carrying a pack of wood, piece of wood on his shoulder. And the body of the boy was lighted up and he saw all the internal organs of the boy. So Jivaka has that, he bought that piece of wood, a piece of uh, sock of wood, put on the, on the ground and suddenly the light disappear. Can see the internal organ of the boys. So what did Jivaka do? He took a stick, a, a wooden stick, one by one, point to the boy until he found the, the actual stick 
that enlighten, that uh, brighten up the body of the boy and see the internal organ. So, what is this legend tell us? Is experimental, scientific approach. He want to verify that a stick can lighten up a body and see the internal organ, but not all the sticks. So he tests one by one, is testing and verified his hypothesis. So to come back, definitely Buddhism uh, encouraged systematic method investigation. Both Buddhism and science emphasize, like I said again, a rigorous observation, systemic analysis in order to avoid biases and errors, statistical error. Both systems emphasize the importance of independent inquiry and critical thinking. Very similar, similar. And logic emphasize the principle of what philosopher of knowledge we call, or philosopher of science, the principle of falsifiability. If you want to prove that it's, it would take time, but just to make it simple, that if you want to prove that something is scientific, you have to be able to prove that it's wrong. And this famous uh, principle of falsifiability, false, falsifiability has been established by Karl Popper in the uh, last uh, century. So hypothesis should be subjected to testing. Everything you have to test and potentially falsifying evidence. And interestingly, when a prime minister mentioned about historical philosophy, you, know, you cannot experiment history. Something that had happened in the past is gone already. But by your thought, using some philosophical approach, you go back to the last event that can clarify and lighten the present and maybe give some direction to the future. And last, logical analysis is used to test and define belief and insight gained through contemplative practice. You know? So the, the main difference here for us, for me, myself as a scientist, when I want to prove something, I do empirical experiment, I test, I verify, I do it again and again. When I find the result, I think that is the truth. I'm not even sure I pass my methodology to other colleagues in different country so that they can repeat the same experiment. If they repeat the same experiment, they find the same result, then it's a good point. So it's empirical, observable. But in Buddhism, logic is experiment thought, is gained through contemplative practices. Yeah. And to be honest, I believe that as a non-scientist, because I have not verified, because in order to verify that my thought are right through Buddhism principle, I have to take some session, learn uh, meditation and contemplative in order to seek the truth. That I keep that for, for the future. So that's about uh, Buddhism and science uh, from the uh, looking at comparing uh, perspective and using logic. Thank you. Yeah, going back a bit to, to dialectical materialism, I don't think many Cambodians really understand this concept. It's, uh, as you mentioned, it's Max, Marxist uh, kind of a political philosophy, right? Uh, dialectical materialism. Maybe if you could explain in simple terms for our audience to understand what, what, what does Prime Minister mean? Uh, uh, dialectical materialism. You know, number one, I'm a scientist. Number two, I'm a Buddhist. And put together, I know my limitation. I have no clue of what is dialectical materialism. I don't know. Yeah. The only thing I know is that I don't know about that. But humbly looking at this, I think to, it, you cannot compare, but a way, probably a little way, same approach in look at thesis, antithesis to seek the truth. You know? Looking at something and one, let's say you take a coin, one side, you look at the other one. If you don't look at the two point, you cannot read the truth. Uh, so that's a very general term or dialectical. But uh, again, I have no knowledge uh, to explain that. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. So I think this is something that we need to dig deeper to uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen, leadership philosophy. These three, three terms, very, very meaningful and, and very critical for, for, for leadership. I agree with you. I think we should take a course with him. 
<laughs> yes, yes, definitely. We, we should uh, attend his class together. Yes, um, definitely. So uh, moving uh, to another topic is on uh, science uh, and technology. Um, of course, you are now uh, serving as a, a Secretary of State of Ministry of uh, uh, Industry, Technology, Innovations. And, and of course, you are trying to link humanities and Buddhism in, in, in science, technology, innovation. So how do Buddhism and science uh, view science, technology, and innovation impact on society? Because at the end of the day, it's about the people, right? The people, livelihood, yeah. happiness, right? Yeah, thank you. So we were, from, we were discussing from the beginning, it was the thinking, the thought. But now it's the action in society. Every reasoning, every type of reasoning must lead to a practical action. That was one of my mentors who taught me when I was in medical school. So I would think that Buddhism and science, or SDI, science and innovation, have different perspectives regarding their impact on society. Yeah? Buddhist perspective, we all know, tend to believe that be careful, material devices, therefore technology, have a potential to increase suffering if you don't use mindfully and with wisdom. You see how recently many examples on people who have said something recorded some time ago, put on TikTok, create a violent reaction on TikTok. If you didn't have that, let's say 50 years ago, when I was young, let's say I was 15 in Phnom Penh, you say something, nobody registered, uh, you know, it's not with the, the, that tape with a plastic band, it takes a long time. Somebody take a camera now, put on TikTok. And when you say something that is not proper, you suffer. Uh, people, uh, you get a backlash. So that's the reason why uh, Buddha is quite, was quite aware of that. Yeah? Uh, so he taught wisdom. Many philosophy, uh, ph philosophers taught about wisdom. You know? They said, uh, mm, so uh, what should I say? Uh, to be careful about your words. Yeah, because in technology today, you're going to put somewhere out of context, there will be a backlash. So that one experience, uh, one example where technology caused suffering, not only to the person who said something that is not proper, but also to other people who have listened that word that or that sentence that may not be proper uh, because the perception is different. Yeah. So that's the STI impact on society based on Buddhist perspective. But if you look at the scientists, they look at the what we call positivist impact of science. Technology is changing our life, making our life better. That's true to a certain level. But it depends how you use it. Particularly, I'm thinking because of my own experience of technology who has dual use. Dual technology, D-U-A-L, dual technology, like nuclear technology. You put in the technology, nothing to do with the, the, uh, the consequence. Long term. It was a decision made by people, by men. Yeah? You give that to the wrong hand. They use the technology to build atomic bomb, to drop two bombs, and kill hundreds of thousands of innocent people, civilians not always soldiers. But if you give this uh, nuclear technology to another group, including myself, we build another, another type of bomb. Uh, 40 years ago, we call that cobalt bomb. It's not used to kill people, but actually to kill cancer cells to save people's life. So you need that balance. So. From the Buddha, Buddha perspective, he's, he's worried about material things. Uh, luckily, Buddha lived uh, 2,500 years ago. But still, Buddha taught us that each of us can be a Bodhisattva by our thinking. So if we use technology you know, by being mindful, mindfulness, maybe we do less harm to the people. And another point is that Buddha also taught us not to be attached to material things. 
Yeah, but we tend to be attached. You look how how this this tool here. camera, cell phone, has changed our life. You know, when I was young, I, you know, 12, 13 year old or 10, uh, spending a weekend with my grandparents in Manginkong. Before I go to sleep, I do a massage of the leg for my grandparents before I go to sleep. When I wake up, I go to salute them, you know. But now before you go to sleep, you kiss your smartphone, make sure that it's not too far to check whatever news you want. And early in the morning when you wake up, you don't try to reach out to your loved one, but you reach out to smartphone. You see, so it has changed a lot. So that Buddha warned us about the attachment to material things. But how can you survive with this without this material thing? It's just philosophical consideration. But for scientists, uh, many, many uh, new toys uh, you know, uh, could be improving people's life. But yet, this day is interesting because particularly intelligent technology that change the relationship between human and machine, man and machine, people start to ask questions, even leaders from the technology high-tech side. They... Chat GPT and GPT-4 uh, was uh, made and launched by OpenAI, is an American company, US company. I read to their website and read their news. They have hired a philosopher in the group. And it's aligned with my thinking. I believe that in every organization, we should have a philosopher to give some guidance regarding the application of technology. Thinking of our country, we have a very young population. And young population embrace new technology without questioning. The you know, adoption rate is very high. Uh, so then this is a philosophical question, or Buddhist uh, question, STI question. How much should we uh, regulate and think before we allow a new tool, a new algorithm to be used. I, that a question that I have no answer. It needs a, a more debate in order to use those questions to enlighten and to inform future policy regulating science and technology. Thank you, Professor. I, I just would like to come back uh, to the question of materialism. Uh, so this is a global concern that uh, social progress toward uh, this kind of materialistic society uh, may harm the ethics and values. Because let's say a society like Cambodia, uh, they give more uh, kind of recognition to wealth and power than wisdom. So that is a big concern. Uh, so how can we change this trend or modify the trend uh, towards more of uh, a humanities, uh, wisdom, uh, so the society will appreciate the wisdom more than wealth and power? Hmm. That's a very difficult question. Can you just say, uh, I've been distracted by this telegram, I just took it out. Can you re uh, rephrase your question, please? The uh, question is uh, relating to how can we change the current trend of increasing materialism mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, so that the society appreciate more knowledge and wisdom, more than wealth and power. <laughs> My gosh. I very humbly, I have no recommendation to anybody. I try to apply that to myself. I, for a long time now, for since I was uh, young, I was a young student, early 20. I thought that I, every individual is driven by three things in life, knowledge, power, and wealth. 
all of us, including myself. The difference is the proportion, is the proportion. And I found my own way doesn't mean that I'm better, I'm smarter, but it's, it's a philosophy that allow me to be quite serene, uh, not too excited about material things. I thought that for me, my personality, my values, my family roots, the pursuit of knowledge is the best for myself. And also I can use knowledge to serve society. Hmm. And for the two other dimensions, I'm in a move. And with that philosophy where the pursuit of knowledge guided my line, my life, I found myself quite happy in this uh, difficult and challenging world. No? Uh, so again, I have been told, I learned that in order to reflect on that, you have, like Buddha taught all of us, try to embrace and recognize the value of mindfulness. Be aware. Yeah. I, I have not been trained for that, but I trained myself that, and as a biology, as a biologist, I, I think as a biologist, you know, very simple, the world, the age of the earth is 4.5 billions of years. Human life, my life, all of us, maximum, we have 80 years. After 80 years, we go back to ashes. And if you look at the belief in uh, ancient Khmer tradition, uh, our body is a microcosm of the macrocosm of the universe. We are made of fire, water, uh, earth and wind no? and it isn't interesting i look at how in the ancient time in cambodia even before Angkor, looking at anthropological studies historical records uh, like many many civilization before the era of writing also that if we believe in those uh, that we are a replica of the cosmos of the universe when we die, our corpse should be disposed four way, you know, by fire, cremation, uh, water, uh, sinking in the water, uh, earth, buried like some religion prescribe, and air when you put your body, uh, some country they put at the top of a hill or in the jungle to be, uh, you know, eaten by uh, by wild animals. So when you look at that, is a the teaching of Buddha. But I reflect this as a more as a somebody who read Buddhist philosophy. I have no proper and deeper knowledge of the Buddhist ritual. I, I observe that every day. So to come back to you, how to be not attached to that material things? It is a personal journey. It's the purpose of life, and for me, the pursuit of knowledge is probably the best option for me because every time in my crazy, I want to do the two other options. Uh, after one hour, two hours, I get so uh, uh, dis uh, distressed, upset that I move back. Let's go back to my books and write paper. The pursuit of knowledge is best for me as a person. It may not be best for other, but it's just a personal pursuit. So life with a purpose, Mindfulness, according to Buddha teaching, would be uh, the answer to all of those uh, attachments. Thank you very much, Professor. So before uh, closing, I would like to seek your advice for young generation of leadership. Uh, you know, um, what should we do more uh, in order to uh, kind of uh, to advance our society in a direction that is more people, uh, sustainable, inclusive, and value-driven uh, society. Because any society without value, it's not a sustainable society. 
materialism is not sustainable, right? It, it come and, and go, uh, like you play in stock exchange, right? It fluctuates all the time. But uh, it, in my tradition also, we always educate our kids. Uh, I give you knowledge, so you could survive and become resilient. <laughs> if I, I can't give you well, right? Because uh, nothing is certain and permanent, as the Buddha said, nothing is permanent. But perhaps mm -hmm. knowledge is permanent and the mm -hmm. truth is permanent. So your advice for maybe young generation in Cambodia? Read the classic. Read more and read every day. I, uh, cut 80% of your time on social media and read the classic, read philosophy. You know, but depend how age you are. Uh, I was lucky when I was young in high school, I was taught philosophy. So, you know, actually if you want, we're talking about spirituality, read about the life of Siddhartha Gautama, read about uh, uh, Muhammad, read about the Christ, you know. There are all a lot of wisdom in those uh, a, a religious book, you know, a lot of wisdom, and read the, the classic. The classic means something that have uh, written 2,500 years ago. Uh, don't read the seven habits of uh, something, the 100 habit, uh, <laughs> you know, rich dad, poor. That's a, it, it leads to pure uh, stupidity. You know, read the classic because all this influence, you know, let's just stop reading all these seven habits, seven, 800, 600. Is this a, not a book, it's a guide written by, I don't know, somebody who had not reached a level of scholarship that is not high enough to share wisdom with people. So avoid those books and read the classic. Yeah, read what, look, you can read in my time, in people, I'm 70 plus, you know, I, you know what I read, I have a big book, Mahapirat, Mahabharata, very, a lot of short story. Each story teach you a moral lesson. Yeah, it's very big, but you cannot, I read just one or two, three pages, you learn a lot. And I have that story to, to teach my student. Uh, so in, in some, read, read and read. Yeah. The wisdom is in the book. When I say book, it could be an e-book and read the classic, the classics. Uh, that's Thank my you very much, Professor. Lesson. I can share with you, I struggle every day trying to be a better person also, like everybody. I'm not exceptional. Thank you very much, Professor, for a very insightful, inspiring, and comprehensive uh, explanation on the relationship between Buddhism and scientific thinking. Uh, I, after listening to, to your explanation, I think there's a clear relationship and connections. And uh, Buddha is, is a scientist. Uh, his philosophy is very relevant and practical, even more than 2,000 years ago, but still practical and relevant today and tomorrow. And I think we should study more Buddhism and how we uh, integrate this Buddhist philosophy in our daily life, our job, career, and our thinking. And we hopefully we can be more enlightened with the Buddhist philosophy and become more wisdom-driven individuals. So that is the purpose of life. And I would like once again to thank uh, Professor Dr. Jam Kereti for spending your valuable time to share your knowledge and inspire us because your pursuit of life is knowledge and learning. And I think this is very important for everyone to pursue their life, knowledge, learning, keep learning and keep reading. So thank you very much, Professor. And thank you all for attending this uh, public lecture series. Uh, it's a jointly organized by the Asian Vision Institute and the Universal Peace Federation. Thank you very much. And see you next time, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.